You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. We sort of a bit brutal as in where you lose on Friday, mate. The job's there for you Monday and you start. He said, yeah, you still train, but you won't be able to be a full-time pro. Just after the final bell, seconds after, Kieran collapsed. The next thing I'm seeing a stretcher come in the ring and the next thing I'm seeing him's on oxygen. And I'm like, I know the brutal side of boxing, but this was, I was experiencing it for real for the first time. And I don't want to say the darkest moment of career, probably the darkest moment of my life, really, do you know? So I've chased them, I've chased them. I'm talking to them as I'm chasing them. And I think they thought, we're not getting away from this lunatic. Just my luck, there's a concrete slab that's loose as he's climbed it. As I'm in the corner there, next thing, I just feel this bang on my head. Um, he slammed the concrete slab down, you know, on my head. And, I, and I've gone down, but I didn't know it was a concrete slab at the time. I've hit the floor, I've gone down on my knee, gone over on my ankle. And I've gone, wow, what? I knew I'd not been punched. I've been punched a lot and I knew that wasn't a punch. The doctor sort of come into me and he says, um, they took me through to this room. And he says, you're the boxer, aren't you? And I says, yeah, yeah, you are, mate. I said to him, he said, you had a fight coming up, didn't you? I said, yes, I'm fighting for my first world title. In um, in four weeks, said, nightmare this, isn't it? But I'll be all right. And, um, <laughs> and um, your man, he goes, and never forget, he said, listen, that won't be happening. And I, and I remember thinking, no, of course it will. What do you mean it won't be happening? And he says, you've got a fractured skull. You've got a fractured skull. And I remember just going numb, just absolutely numb. The night in July, um, we come to the arena, come to the arena, it was my world title fight. And that was it, I thought, not many people in life get a chance for the dreams, you know, for the dreams to come true. And I thought that night I had a chance to make that dream come true. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Anthony Crowley. How are we, brother? Mate, I'm good, James. Good to be here, mate. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having us. World champion boxer, Manchester. Your home turf, mate. I'm down here. Yes. He you says your gran actually stays a she mile away. Not even my, no, my nana there. She's a few hundred yards away, like the house where I started, uh, where I grew up till I was 10, 11, were a mile away, something mm -hmm. like that. Obviously, the uh, just over there, a bit of an history lessons where uh, Manchester United started. So, yeah. Throw name spot. in straight we're away, are you, bro? That's me just left half my, my, my <laughs> Manchester fans. <laughs> <laughs> so, I always go back to the start with my guest, brother. Yeah. How, where, it grew up, where you grew up and how it all began? Um, so I grew up to the age of 10. I was in um, Newton Heath, where we are sort of now. It's, um, it's one of them, James, listen, I can, I can never pretend, oh, I had it hard or anything like that because um, I didn't. But I think from a very early age, I was, I was taught, you know, if you want anything in life, you've got to work hard for it. It's... Um, like I say, with, with my mum and dad, I think I owe them absolutely everything where my mum and dad, like the, you know, they both worked, but my dad's a postman, my mum works in a supermarket. So they're not the best paid jobs in the world, but they'd work hard and we never went without. But at the same time, we was, we would appreciate everything. We'd appreciate everything, me and my two brothers and then my, my younger brother come up when we was um, like 10, 11 as we moved house. But it was, um, I think I taught, I learned from my parents early, like, you know, anything nice you want, the sacrifices that have to be made. Like like I said, I'll never pretend um, that, I, that I had it hard and stuff like that, but I know, like, my dad would either take on an extra job and my mum an extra hours just to take us on holiday each year. But there's also time, like you say, where, Joe, you know, we weren't one of them where it was hardly poverty, but we didn't... <laughs> You know, didn't have a car and so like, so anywhere I got to go training wise, I was getting buses to and stuff like that. So yeah, I was I was taught like from an early age, anything you want in life worth having, you've got to work yeah. hard for. So a good loving family, worked hard, yeah. showed you the ropes out here. Work, yeah, if you want very, something in life, just work for that. Yeah, very close, uh, very close family. And not the family as in like, 
who will tell each other we love each other every day. I, I've told my mum and dad I love them once mm -hmm. in my life. Um, <laughs> but see it just now, bro. It's tell them, them, mate. Tell them. Mate, no, but I, uh, <laughs> that's it. But I say I am. You're getting shows like that. Yeah, that. Yeah. I couldn't, <laughs> if I said to my dad, oh, dad, you know, I love you. My dad is like, off. give me a bell. I can uh, cough yourself, get. Like, I couldn't say I have told them uh, once in my life. Um, but nah, the, the, um, they done so much, you know, for us. And I think from an early age, I was always a kid who was like, into sports and they got um i remember my mum jump just just around the corner really jumping on buses with me to take me to a boxing gym while my dad was in work and my dad was the first one who took me to a boxing gym because basically there was no one to look after me but it was it was one of them it was just to channel some of the energy but yeah one of three brothers um an older brother and a younger brother both very different super close but uh the you just don't ones, tell each other you love quieter. them no nah, we don't we uh the older ones a lot quieter and stuff like that um where the other ones the younger ones a bit of a wild child and he's like probably like my best mate but also the biggest pain in my ass in my life yeah. as well so yeah good mate sort of born strong tight knit family yeah like i said my nana's across the mm -hmm. literally up the road who's there, in her 80s who so was wanting to get a rottweiler yeah, just a few weeks mad. ago <laughs> just a few weeks she lost her, um, her old dog a big white Murano, not long back and um she wanted she was like, no, I don't want a little dog. We was trying to get her in some little. And um, anyway, she wanted the Rottweiler. We was trying to put her off that. And um, she settled on a Whippet. So we met halfway. Mm -hmm. How was um, your schooling and stuff? <laughs> yeah, we schooled. Me, um, my mum, she certainly, she's not the cleverest, like, academically. But she, I think she didn't want me to be like that. So from an early age, she'd always make sure I'd do my schoolwork and... And I think through school, like I said, I went to school just around the corner growing up and then just up the road with high school. I love school. There's a lot of um, people who, you know, growing up, they hate school. But for school for me was some of the best times of my life. I loved it all. And I don't think I was a bad kid. I can't pretend I was a bad kid. Listen, like most lads, I was a bit of a joker and probably pushed it a little bit too far sometimes. But I, um, I love school and I got, really, my one regret is, I probably should have done better in school than I did do. And um, I think it's only now that I'm realising that where because of what I go into, I'm sure we got onto that where with like working with children in the area and stuff like that, where I might have to do a few exams, which I might not have had to, but I would have listened a bit more in school. Mm -hmm. But yeah, from an early age, I was always, it was, I would just, it comes to a point where, you know, homework, I just do the bare minimum. And listen, I've done all right in school, but it was always sort of boxing was always the um, the end goal. I always said the right thing. If you know, I want a backup plan. I want something to fall back on. But realistically, I never put enough effort into making mm -hmm. sure I have a backup plan. Yeah. What age did you start then training hard for boxing? Um, I remember say around eight or nine. My dad had some uh, keys to the to the gym because he 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 was an ex professional boxer but retired, and he he um. He'd have keys and on a Sunday. I'd go with him a few times a week and on a Sunday, he'd take me, mate, take me, a few of my cousins, and I used to beat them all up on the Sunday. <laughs> I used to go there and um, but I think and then I went back because then my dad's shifts changed and just before I was just before I was eleven, I knew you had to be eleven to fight. And um, just before I was eleven, I went back to the amateur gym. Um, my mum took me on the bus, and yeah, I was I was hooked on it ever since. Like first two sessions, two session, yeah, two sessions. I I knew I was like playing football, cross country, stuff like that. But I knew that was where I wanted, you know. So that was that was the sport I wanted to concentrate on. Did your dad support you fully? Get into it, knowing how yeah. dangerous the sport can be as well. I um, yeah, he did. Because like I said, he was you know he was an expert himself, but he was never a pushy dad, and I like that about him. He was. Um, it was always, I think he was proud. He's not the type to tell me he's proud of me. <laughs> but um, I'm making him out to be a bit of a monster. <laughs> right? oh, but I'm not meaning to. But no, he is. He is proud, but he was ne he's never a the tough type. man, though. Yeah, and that's just how he was. And that's how I was yeah. sort of brought up. And he um, he's encouraged it, but he was never like, oh, I'll make sure you get there. He was like, no, you want to go to the gym. You And I think that was probably part of the little test mm -hmm. for myself. You get there yourself and... I'd have to get the bus on my own and stuff like that to get there. It wasn't him being a mean dad or not a supportive dad. I think it was just like, no, if you, I think it's to see, are you serious about it? Yeah, were you training every day or wasn't. anything? Yeah, all, I think all the time really from being, being 11, like 
you make sacrifices right from you know not playing out with your friends. mates uh, your friends and hanging around and listen i think a lot of good comes out of that as well but um i wouldn't say because of the training i probably didn't have the childhood that a lot of mm-hmm. you know my mates did really so you had a lot of discipline for a very young age yeah i did i think i did that was um I always believe, I mean, I say this right till the, the end of my career, I got the very best out of what I had. Um, I was never the most talented fighter or the fastest, most powerful, but I I think I worked hard to try and make up for it in them areas. And I think from um, an early age, I was always dedicated. Like the um, my friends would be out on a Friday night and Saturday night, I'd, I'd be out running hard, go home to bed early because I was getting up early the next day to go training. So yeah, I think I think from an early age I was obsessed. I was obsessed and um, just to try and get the best out of what I had. And I think we then moved up the road, sort of to New Moston. And um, so even like my mates, I remember once we was out on a Friday. <laughs> we was out on a Friday night, and I'd just come back from the gym. Literally, been back from the gym. Tell me, I just went up to see my mates. They were probably having a few Fosters, few ciders, whatever, and. Um, Literally went to see him. One of the lads has decided to rob a car. Um, he brings it. And anyway, I remember getting, one of the lads gets in. It was like one of my best mates. Pulls a daft damn break. Anyway, I caught for it. Got, you know, skittled. And I think that scarred me. Do you know what I mean? So mm. I, was, I was very, very lucky. Bent round a lamppost, the car. If not, it could have been very different. And I think from that age, I... Um, and I thought, no, you know, if I've got to be serious, I can't be hanging around on street corners and stuff like that. So I think, I think it was about 14, 15 then. That was a wake-up call for you? That was a wake-up call, mm-hmm. yeah. And um, it's mad I kept it secret for like 20 years. I told mm-hmm. my mum and dad it was a hit and run. <laughs> and, um, mm-hmm. One of my mates let it out. Um, yeah, was it? Was that, he was in his best man speech or something <laughs> like that. I was like, fucking hell, I kept uh-huh. that quiet for 20 uh-huh. years. So yeah, I had to lie and say it was a mm. bit of a hit and run, but he was one of my best mates who skittled me, to be honest. But he was either whether he robbed the car or paid some money for an old Nova yeah. or something like that. Just shows you, though, how fast your life can turn yeah, for you. Yeah, could have done it. Training just every day, yeah, and people drinking, yeah. taking drugs. 14, 15, 16 is a crucial age yeah, for any teenager to try and make something of a life. Once you go down that slippery slope, it is very difficult to pull it back when you start drinking from a young age. And you know, and listen, I, I, I think I said it before, I can't pretend to be like some of the guests who've been on the show or out like that because I come from a loving home and stuff like that. But there is, there's temptations everywhere. And you know, there's always ways where you can make fast money and stuff like that. And the temptations are always there and you've got to be strong enough to no, no, I'm going to stick to the plan that I've set out. I'm going to try and achieve that goal. And um, yeah, that's it really. But I knew from an early age, you know, I was pretty unlucky with stuff like that. So I, <laughs> I, um, mm-hmm. I probably, I learned sort of now, I'm best off sort of yeah. staying, staying out of trouble. Did you have any temptation at 16, 17, 18 to think, did you ever feel as um, if you were missing out on anything? Or were you just no, totally was, focused on the game I plan? Was, I was totally focused on trying to, you know, achieve that dream, which I set out from an early age. But listen, there was times early on in my professional career where things didn't seem to be going the way. Because I had a lot of ups and downs, but um, where, like you say, I'm not, I'm not going to pretend there was you know, a bad boy or anything like that. But of course, there, w- there would have been an easy option for me to start doing a bit of stuff on the side that I shouldn't have been doing. I could have earned money to fund it. But I've always worked with, with like, the children in my old amateur boxing club, you know, the young lads, and now it'd be girls, because the women's game's getting so big. But I, I just thought, I'm a bit of a fraud if I'm sort of trying to direct them in life and I'm doing wrong on the other side. So, yeah, but I mean, listen, when you, you're from a working class area, there's always people you know who either are up to no good and you can get involved with. So, yeah, the, of course, like... The temptation always passes your mind, but I had to be strong enough for that. What was your amateur career like? Yeah, the amateur career. Amateur career. I won. I won a few national titles, box for my country. Um, I never believed that I got the chances to go to the big major tournaments, Olympics, um, Olympics, Commonwealth Games. Because at the time, there was um, a lad called Frankie Gavin, unbelievably talented, um, and he, he'd go to all the major tournaments, and rightly so. But Frankie ended up missing the weight for the Beijing Olympics in two thousand and eight. And with that, it was sort of like, I was just sort of, I was going to squads, weren't really enjoying them, didn't think I was learning too much at the time. 
I'm just thinking, but there's no end product here. So that's why I decided to turn professional. Um, probably a little bit too early, really. I was still a boy, but... Yeah, yeah. Was it was 18, 19? 19, 19 I was, yeah. but I was, um, I was still a kid, really. But yeah, I just thought I'd try and get a head start like that. What was your first fight like? My first fight, it was um, it was at the arena. So you got to bear in mind, I've been at that arena as, do you know, as, a, as a, a young child, supporting some of the greats of British boxing, you know, before Ricky Atten, obviously the Manchester lad, your Nazi Mohammed, Joe Calzaghi's, and just sort of dreaming of one day, you know, headlining there. I mean, at the time they had made me pro debut there. So yeah, that was... That was the perfect stage, you know, for it. But um, it was one of them I thought there's a chance there was something called a live floater where if it works out well, I would have gone on just before Joe Calzaghe in front of a packed out stadium. If it works out bad, you're going on after the main event. So unlucky for me, it worked out bad. So <laughs> only the, the cleaners mm -hmm. and the uh, the few hundred tickets mm -hmm. that sold was in there. <laughs> But yeah, no, it was um, no, it was perfect. That was the start of you know my pro why, career. Why? Why is that? Why? So sometimes I'll see That's the main event, but then the cameras will go on and interviewing, but somebody's fighting. Why is that? It. But I don't know. Because, what does that mean? Because it's got it's, everything's got to run to television. Right. You know, you can't overrun because then it, right. goes, it runs into programs uh -huh. after that, and that's all it uh -huh. is. And um, like I said, it can either be a really good thing or a really bad thing. And the handful of times I had it, I never got any luck. I was always <laughs> after the main event. So yeah. yeah. How good, how, we'll touch on Joe Kozaki. Do you not think he's underrated for, the, for, for what he's done? He's got to be one of the greatest then. ever. Yeah, without a doubt. And uh, for me, he's, he's my favourite British fighter yeah. ever. And obviously, Ricky being a Mancunian, but yeah, Joe. And it was, you know what it is, James? Well, you know, when they say about, I'd say he's one of my heroes. And I mean, they say about meeting your heroes, but with Joe Kozaki, it was the opposite. Like, just a great guy. And mm. it's just like, I remember in Bournemouth, I mean, yeah, it was, it was not even a year ago. Um, was out sort of with him and you know you're having a drink and, and you think it's mad how things work out you know if someone would have told you one day oh you'll be having a drink with your hero mm -hmm. and stuff like that and yeah he's um, a ah, great guy great guy yeah. done great things phenomenal career yeah. and Ricky Hatton how's that relationship for him being a blue and you a red that's nice good Ricky <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's mate, yeah he's a good rivalry yeah. he's a good rivalry but um, I always sort of said it with uh, I'd always go out with only Ricky you'll never see that support again like taking 30,000 people over to Vegas and I think you know Ricky sort of united he'd have reds and blues he'd have reds there you know at the um, arena watching him and likewise when I I'm not comparing myself to Ricky but I'd have you know City fans who'd come and watch us he'd have all the City songs being sang I'd have all the United songs being sang throughout but um Ricky was just a massive, massive inspiration. You know, when you see a young Manchester lad off the estate um, do so well, he, he can only help but dream. You can only help yeah. but dream. And um, that that was it. You just, I think every, not even every Mancunian kid, I think almost every Brit wanted to be like Ricky Atten at the time. You'd never seen, you'd never seen support like it for a fighter. Why do you think some people, because you've got a massive support as well, every yeah. time your arena was absolute bouncing. bouncing yeah. Why is that? Is that Manchester or is I that... Think to, what, why do you think some just, fighters have got a great reputation, but yet others yeah. are great fighters, but nobody likes them? I think what was... Obviously, I think with Ricky, he was just seen as one of the lads, wasn't he? He was seen as one of the lads. Out of the pints and, and that. And stuff. And I think with us, I was just like, I was always involved in the amateur scene and at shows and, you know, boxing shows and... And there was good, there was good rivers and this and obviously then a football team attaches yourself to, you know, I was great where a load of Manchester United supporters realistically probably don't remember seeing any of the fights, but they had a full day on the piss, mm -hmm. you know, watching the football and, um, and then coming to watch us. But it was, and I think that was it really. They just obviously I had a bit of a story as well, which, which took off. Um, I think that, that helps. And I just think, Ricky and I think myself if, you, if you're good to people and they like that and they buy into it and they want to support you and they want to see you do well and I was always really thankful of yeah. that that's really good isn't it because I know we'll touch on it later down but when you in your yeah. face was it Hometown that song was yeah, it James what a tune that James, is by the way yeah and, you're, and it was bouncing you'll tend yeah. to see Manchester Liverpool Glasgow yeah the fans are tight yeah. Leeds, they're all fucking very nuts. Very similar cities. I know yeah. there's rivalry like but very similar cities a lot of the time it's just football that mm -hmm. separates them but 
Very similar series. Yeah, but if somebody comes through the ranks, they will unite. Yeah. Because Tony Bell, you was on and he says totally. he's a mad blue, but he is. He's, a, he's a scouser before he before is a blue. He is. Yeah. I love that. No, of course, he's right. And I heard that and I'd be the same here. Like, I'm I'm a big United fan, but I'm a man and I'm a proud man mm -hmm. before anything. Yeah. So, yeah, I've just like, even what we've had recently going on with the Lord Mayor, you know, Andy Burnham and that, mm -hmm. I'm like, getting that's our leader. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, I yeah. like that shit as yeah. well, mate. Bend a brain yeah. for no one, mate. Telling you, yeah. and that's it. <laughs> So when you started going through your professional career, you yeah. went eight undefeated. Was it eight undefeated? Yeah. And then you get a loss. How yeah. was that? Because you had two early so losses was, in your yeah, career. Yeah, I had two early losses. And, but the first loss, Jordy taught me, James, and I think it's sort of a lesson for anything in life. I was seen as this, you know, young, hot prospect coming through. I'd not really put a foot wrong. And then um, it was like my first TV date. And I remember like, may I remember writing out the status on Facebook or something. It would have been back in the day. Do you know, tune in, blah, blah, I'm on at this time. And um, I don't want to say it was an humbling because I was never, honestly, I was never the cocky type, but I got beat um, my first time they showed me on TV proper um, by unboxing what you call the journeyman. And it wasn't, and basically a journeyman is someone who turns up most weeks, gets beat, but looks to go the distance so he can fight again. You don't have a 30 day suspension. And, um, yeah, but the guy used to follow media and basically it was like, it was a part-time ice cream man. So you can imagine how that went down, can't you? <laughs> Mr. Whippy and all that and stuff. Um, yeah, so it was it was a mad sort of, I remember like my best mate after it, we, we're um, sat in the car park and we're going, I'd always like go out after the fight and you know, you see everyone local who bought tickets. I always thought, you know, it's good to sort of say thank you. Um, and... I remember thinking, I think I'm saying like, oh, I don't want to go in here, you know. Fucking eyes here, stitches in my head and stuff. And he went, no, I went, get it out of the way. You go out there, because a lot of people there, you'll address it straight away. You're not hiding, you're not showing your face. And it was for me, I, I was embarrassed and that's no disrespect to the opponent, but I put it right later on in my career. But it was sort of, do you know what I seen, James? I seen who was there for the long run. I seen who was there for the long run and I sold a lot of tickets. But then the fight after, those tickets got cut in half because, and I don't, it's one of them I didn't take it personal. There was a few of my mates like, oh, the fucking sellouts. Then so I was like, no, I said, there after the gym, Ricky would finished at the time, sort of, or he's there, thereabouts. And they wanted a, a journey to follow. Yeah, they wanted a replacement and they thought I was going to be it. And if I'm getting beat off part-time boxers, part-time ice cream mans, I'm not going to be the guy to take him mm. to Vegas or to give him those big nights at the arena. So I understood it. And they come back later in my career buying tickets. And I was thankful when they come back because I thought, do you know, I know, but I also realized people around me who was there for me. I learned early on, do you know, who was there for the long run, who was there for the tough times and who wasn't. So I, I learned early on, you know, he was in my circle and he was going to stay in my circle. What was the mindset like after the defeat, take a couple of it days was, off or straight back at yeah, the gym? Yeah, it was. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't too sort of well after it, but no excuse, but I, um, so I had to have a bit of a break, but I just wanted to put things right. I just wanted to put things right. And, um, and that's it. Well, I just wanted to get in the circle. We boxed a few fights later and I did put it right, but it was just, it was hard. It was hard to take. Do you know what I mean? You stopped getting looked at the same you stop getting looked at the same and you was just remembered for getting beat. And that that was it. You wasn't remembered for being, all of a sudden I wasn't this, ah, oh, the next big thing around Manchester. And it was, it was very sort of, wow. Brought the bubble burst. Yeah, the bubble burst. Yeah. Well and truly. <laughs> mate, yeah. Mr. Whippy, yeah? Mate, yeah. It's, um, oh, my mates are brutal, like the WhatsApp group, every lad does. And, oh, <laughs> mate. Terrorising me. Yeah. But that's what and makes then, you um, of course appreciate do. life. And yeah. it's all the obstacles and the knockdowns that make you a better person. Some people don't react to them well, and that's why they'll never fulfill yeah. any needs or fulfill and any life ambitions. I yeah. could have walked away from it there and stuff what we were saying earlier, maybe gone down the wrong path then and thought, well, I'll try and earn a few quid doing something else. But I thought, no, stick with it. Mm -hmm. In 2012 was the fight with, was English title with Kieran Farrell. Yeah. How's that yeah. for a boxer when, if you end somebody's career in it the ring, how does that affect that you? That was the darkest moment in my career that, you know, James, yeah. like I said, I mentioned, you know, losing for the first time. I lost fights after that as well. And I lost, you know, with with that, so 
obviously for anyone who don't know, we had you know we had a great fight. It was for an English title. It was on a non TV show. And listen, I had I had a job ready to start Monday because I wouldn't have been able to. If would have lost that, there's no way I could have been a full time pro. So. I would have had a job, my mate had a security company and he gave me a job in the offices. And it was sort of a bit brutal as in where you lose on Friday, mate, the job's there for you Monday and you start. He said, yeah, you still train, but you won't be able to be a full-time pro. And it was off TV, it was online and it was in a cold, it was a warehouse called The Bowlers. They have a lot of raves there now and stuff like that, but it was a cold, cold um, night. And in there, it was, do you know what I mean? You could see your own breath, it was freezing in there and the real sort of bare pit atmosphere, you know, here in a bit of a Manchester dive, came just outside in a place called Haywood, and I think the crime rate must have been zero there because I think half of Haywood had turned <laughs> up that night. And obviously, I did, we had a rowdy crowd. And um, anyway, we boxed and we had we had a great fight. And I come for it, one on points. And just after the final bell, seconds after, Kieran collapsed. And I was a bit like, wow, I, this was before a decision had been given or anything like that. You know, what's going on? What's going on? And uh, I'm seeing, and the next thing I'm seeing a stretcher come in the ring and the next thing I'm seeing him's on oxygen. And I'm like, I know the brutal side of boxing, but this was, I was experiencing it for real for the first time. And yeah, James, it was, I don't want to say the darkest moment of career, probably the darkest moment of my life, really, mm. do you know? And, um, there's an image that never leaves me. And I remember him getting stretched out the ring and I'm just looking like, what, what's going on? And I remember his mum, God bless her, she's holding onto his hand, she's holding onto her little son's hand and she's breaking her heart and he's, he's you know, he's unconscious. And I'm thinking, I don't want to do this no more. Do you know, like, it still lives with me. And for, anyway, you know, thankfully, he had a bleed on the brain, he could never box again. But he's ended up making a full recovery. I was actually with him yesterday. Um, he trains fighters and stuff. And he's made a full recovery now. He can never box again. But for months, it was just, it left me and my trainer said, he went, it took you a bit to get over that. He said, I watched you just lost a little bit of devilment yeah. in the ring and you just wasn't the same fighter. And I couldn't see him for, I didn't see him for good. It sounds bad this because I'm not that kind of guy where I was thinking, should have gone. I remember after the fight, just being up all night and you're looking for updates and it's a lot of Chinese whispers in your ear and he takes a turn for the worst and stuff. And I'm just thinking, I just want this boy to pull through. Do you know, there can be rivalry before it and stuff. I just want this to come through. I just want him to come through. And, you know, thankfully he did, but I couldn't turn up to the hospital because I thought, I didn't know how his family was going to be or it just wasn't the time. And then, I left it a bit of time and it just, it's one of them, you know, when you put things off and you keep putting it off and putting it off. And, and to be fair with Kieran, I've told him this and he says, do you know what, I'm glad you did. He said, because I probably needed that bit of cooling off period. Mm -hmm. And anyway, I remember one day and I said, oh, I dropped him a message and said, you know, I'd love to come and see the gym one time and all that. I didn't really worry about it. So I was just scared, but I just, mm -hmm. I knew it was the right thing to do. And he went, yeah, yeah. And then he said, I said, come up. Uh, I remember just, Getting in, the, <laughs> getting in the car, putting the postcode in. I just turning my phone off, thinking I'm just going. I'm not looking mm -hmm. at anything on my phone till till I get there or speaking to anyone because otherwise I might turn around. Anyway, I went in and with a minute or two, it was fine. Then do you know what I mean? It was, it was a little bit mm -hmm. awkward. We're good mates now. We're good mates, and um, all he ever wanted is like, you know, him to do well now and stuff like that. But yeah, when you see someone potentially nearly lose the life, you know, at your hands, it just it did it affected me in a big yeah. way and I didn't I love boxing I love the training stuff but I thought do I want to do this anymore yeah, that it's, shows you how brutal it is though but that shows you I've your character it. because you are such a good yeah. guy that no, it would, you would have lost that fire in the thank ring thank you and I did I didn't know I did until like I got told like after it and then it come back it come back boy it was um, it was horrible do you know like I was scared with like I say I can still see it there clear now just his mum holding his hand and she breaking Oof. her heart and I would thought could have been my mum that, and yeah. I know she would have been the same. And that sport, mate, it's, it's, it's brutal. brutal. It yeah. is. I've seen it. Like just, I've seen that, that. I always say about boxing. I imagine about most sports, the highs are so high. Like you know, I've had some of the best nights of my life, but the lows, and not even just me. Like the lows, to to get you. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I've seen friends, and I've seen friends, partners upset, and family members who you know they're heartbroken and I'm just like 
oh, it gets you. Do you know what yeah. I mean? It gets you, and I'm like, do you think if he died, you you would have quit boxing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would have quit boxing. I wouldn't have. I couldn't have done it. I, I wouldn't have been able to stay in a boxing gym. I don't. I don't. It sounds dramatic, but. I'd have always, like, say, worked with my amateur club and with the kids and stuff like that. I don't think I could have stopped in a boxing gym again. I think I would have had to move away from it altogether. Um, thankfully, I didn't. And it's mad, like, now, obviously, he trains his own fighters and stuff like that. But, yeah, if if um, it would the worst would have happened... I don't think I don't yeah. really watch boxing again. It's class that you're both now friends because he was yeah. 14 and 0 at the time. He yeah, was he was coming through the he ranks. Was. He was he was a good fighter, and I believe that night he, he would have beat a lot of good fighters. And it was just it's sad, and maybe it's in you know it was in has plan for him to go a different way, and that's what he's doing yeah. now. Fair play, it is. So after that, then because you fought for the British title, maybe two or three fights later, was it? Yeah, Derry? I'd won it. No, that was before it. That, was that was before, before the match? it. Yeah, you lost that one yeah, before that. Yeah, so I'd lost, so I'd won it, and then I'd, I lost, I lost it. So like, say my career had a lot of ups roller and downs, coaster. mate, a proper <laughs> roller coaster. So that was another one where you know, I'm in your own town, and I'd, I'd got my career back and tried absolutely flying, and do you know, underestimated someone. I don't think underestimated. I just got caught by a shot, and I didn't. Do you know, you got beat in your own backyard. It was sort of just up the road, really, where it wasn't. That was another one of them where you think, I remember getting out and thinking, I'm done with this boxing game. But, you know, you say things in the heat of the moment. And it, like I say, you know, with the lows being so low, I remember getting back to my parents' house and my dad's going, Aunt, you know, just watch this. And I'm like crying my eyes out as, my, mm. you know, as I'm watching this fight and I'm thinking, oh, but again, it's just get it over and done with. And then you, you look to build, tomorrow's a new day. You look to build again. And then we boxed again. We drew, didn't we? Um, you won that fight though, that's I it. I thought yeah. so. I thought everyone, I think nearly yeah. everyone thought that. And there was plenty of bit of crowd trouble that night. And yeah, it's, it was, someone was just talking about it earlier. But yeah, just great nights, you know, in boxing, like mad atmosphere. The old echo, it was in Liverpool. And really, I should have either give it a draw, but I thought it'd be different. But yeah. yeah, but like you say, a proper roller coaster. And thankfully, sort of after that, my career took off then in a big way. Do you think that helps a fighter when they yeah. get low and you've still got the strength to kick on? Definitely, and, because and keep from fighting. early on, I'd lost a few early on before, you know, kicking on with my career. Like after that, we, um, I was like handed a chance and I was the opponent with Eddie Earn. So I was fighting a lad of Welsh that called Gavin Reese, who was a good, good fighter. And I knew again, my, my little lad was on the way and you know, my partner was a few months away from giving birth. And again, that was one of them where I knew if I won that fight, I could be a full-time professional. If not, I thought, I'm going to have to have a job on the side. Then you don't know, you you can't concentrate the way that you, you want to on training. You don't know how you'll develop. And you might think, you know what, I'll do something else. I'll, um, I'll do something else as a career. But thankfully, I come through and that then gave me the deal with Matchroom, which then... It took off. It took mm. off for me, thankfully. How is it though, if your missus is pregnant, does that change your mentality as if you can't get in there willing to basically die to then start having other priorities no, and not think I, about yourself? I I was. I was always, it's, it's, you know, it's a bad thing to say, but I was always willing to leave it in there. I was mm. always willing to leave it in there, but, you know, I think you're doing it for the your family, children, yeah. your family, aren't you? And I knew winning that night would then give me a deposit on an house and then it'd make life, you know, a little bit, we'd get us, get us on the ladder because for the first few months I was living in, you know, my partner's, their parents' house, her parents' house. Um, so I didn't want that, you know, a proud man. I wanted to, mm -hmm. you know, you want to supply, you know, for your family yourself. But yeah, that's, that's what that does. But it's mad because even in title fights and world title fights, there'll be a form you have to sign. It's such a strange one. It's, if the worst is to happen to you, where are your wages going? And, you know, I'm having to put basically a next of kin down and who who you want, what percent you want going to such a body. And, and yeah, so it is mad. Like, as you, and it's always on the fight day or the fight before, but you're thinking, I'm like, potentially, I'm signing, signing your a will. Yeah, it's like, I'm signing a will here to see mm -hmm. where my wages are going. 
Yeah, it's fucking scary shit, man. Yeah. Isn't it? You fought a couple of my Scottish boys. Uh, yes. We'll touch on Willie Lemon first. Yeah. Who's an absolute nutcase. I love Great Willie. Guy. I love Willie. Great but I don't, guy. I don't love Willie. I love Willie Lemon, though. No. <laughs> 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 Whether that out or maybe I do, do you know what I mean? <laughs> no, character. He's been yeah. on the podcast. He spoke Great highly guy. of you on the nah. podcast. Willie's one of the best people I've met in boxing mm-hmm. in life, not just boxing. He's yeah. a great guy. And um, it was mad. We actually ended up boxing each other. But before that, I'd gone down, sparring down Glasgow. And, um, Go farm look? Yeah, stopping in Gafam. Mm. Great neighbourhood. Yeah, great, nice great mate. neighbourhood. Mate, Wild. everyone's door was just left open. You'd walk <laughs> into houses. That's because they've all been kicked in with the poles, <laughs> mate. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I remember everyone would just walk in. I'd be thinking... What's this? Yeah. Do you know like I never know. Oh, just sit down. I yeah. thought, but I thought it was great, mate. Just mm-hmm. then, everyone was by the end of the week or a few weeks. I knew everyone. Do you know what I mean? It was great. I would probably felt free to walk in people's yeah. houses. <laughs> but what an area! And um, it was mad, and it was it was that tough, like because I struck up a little friendship with these two little lads, and then a year later we boxed, we fighting each other for a British title, and do you know it went my my way that night, and. Um, I could hear his son, you know, a little bit upset ringside and that's tough, do you know what I mean? And thankfully, Willie come in, see me after it and brought the lads in, uh, Drew and Jake and just two great kids. But they're like, after it, again, I don't know what people say, oh, he sounds soft, but that one I'm hearing his son, you know, ringside and I think that's horrible. It's horrible. Then when they come in after it and literally, you know, show them the belt and stuff, the, the great, you know, that's the mm-hmm. lovely side of the sport. And, uh, but... Yeah, William on Scotland, no, great place, mad. Glasgow. Mad, what, a career, mad. what a career I know, man. He went yeah, to Mexico. Very and Mexico, when he, His career was flying, I think. He was still undefeated when he fought Can. Put yeah. Can in his ass. I think Can he actually got, got over 10 seconds. Count. Yeah, he got the long count, yeah. didn't he? But yeah, Willie was very, very good. Uh, we was at, yeah, I remember we was at, was we at Peter Harrison's gym that day? Oh, no, that was a few years later yeah. when he'd gone, but... Mm-hmm. Great, real sort of, you know, real fighting city, Glasgow. Yeah, oh, it's nuts. Ricky Burns as well, another Ricky, great yeah, fight, just two outside Warriors. outside of, yeah, and I think with that, there was a great atmosphere that night because the arena had not long been open after the Manchester bombing and it was, do you know what, that's the only fight, that James, and Ricky's a great guy and stuff, but I remember before I had the worst nerves. Everyone was a pretty, I was pretty cool, me. It was, for me, it was just a job. Do you know, I'm certainly not a violent person, it was just a fight and... We're going to shake hands after it. And that's how he always looks at it, especially with Ricky. He's a nice, nice guy. And um, But it wasn't long after the bombing and I had great support that night. You know, a few made the trip down for Ricky as well. But um, I always remember in the day, I went for a little walk. My mum and my auntie had always come and see me on the day of the fight. She couldn't come to the fights. Like, two nerves. And I'd have a bit of a sit down with her. She'd have a coffee and that. You know, just let her know. See, I'd, I'd be all right and everything. And um, I remember some old woman, I was walking back to my hotel room and she says, oh, she goes, good luck tonight. We're all rooting for you. And I says, oh, thank you, though. She went, we're going to watch you, all the family. And she went, don't be letting us down. I remember thinking, <laughs> oh, oh. I remember she was an old, yeah. she's only an older woman. She, mean, I was, mm-hmm. she went, there's a lot of, with what we've had in this city lately, you know, you put a smile on our face. And do you know when someone just stitch her and you think, You've got to embrace pressure sometimes. That's what I believe, you know, there's a lot of people who'd love to be in your position, but that just got me. And I remember being locked in my hotel room and thinking, I wish it was someone else tonight. Do you know, yeah. with everything that had happened mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And I remember, I remember my cousin, she was there that, that horrible night. Thankfully she was all right. She, <sighs> she probably missed, she probably, I'm not over exaggerating, she probably missed death by a few seconds. Um, you know, she was covered in blood through the explosion and, it it was like just very sort of surreal sort of eerie kind of yeah like it wasn't long after it there was there was an event a few weeks before but Mm -hmm. it was it was a packed out crowd and yeah were you worried that 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 could have happened at your event (sighs) do you know what i i wasn't because i knew sort of security checks Mm -hmm. and stuff but you just don't know it was Mm -hmm. it was a big crowd to have in and if it was target it was a possible target security was so tight Mm -hmm. But still, it was an horrible worry, and like there's there's family members there, there's friends. Listen, not just that, there's people who paid the money to come and support me. Yeah, are you a worrier, Anthony? What's do you that? worry a lot? Overthink? <sighs> do you know what? I think I do at things, but at the same time, I learned from a friend that there's no point in worrying about things that you've got no control of. It's a waste of energy, and 
if you've no longer got control of, of that, you can only hope, hope it pans out the way you do. And if you're going to stress and worry about things, then it's just wasted energy. You're sending mm -hmm. yourself mad. Yeah. So after that, career started thriving, got a few wins under your belt. Yeah. And then you got the world title shot, but you ended up chasing two burglars <laughs> down the street. You, you yeah. fractured skull, you broke your ankle. Yeah. What's that story? <laughs> Mate, yeah, I think a lot of a lot of them will know about that, but it was um it was like four weeks before my first world title fight, like you said, worked hard for it and Christmas was cancelled in my house that year. And anyway, my, my trainer at the time my trainer Joe's been my trainer throughout really, after my first sort of twelve fights or something. Joe at the time he said I was flying and um he said, Listen, I want I was going to the running track he said, I want you to have the night off. He said, you're ahead of schedule. I don't want you peaking over, be, you know, getting there too soon. I just want you to go home, rest up, spend some time with the family and I'll see you in the morning. We'll fire up again. So I was like, right, okay. I had my running stuff with me. So I literally diverted and gone home. So as I pulled up, the next door neighbors, um, alarms going off and straight away, like, like anyone, if you wear an alarm going off, you're just thinking, Fuck, when's that going to go off? Um, and I, I went. I actually phoned my next door neighbour at the time. I've gone, Craig. I've gone. Your alarm's going off here, mate. I said. I don't think anyone's in. And he says, you know what? I'll ring the missus now. I think she's just gone gym. So he rang her anyway. And jokingly, I said, oh, just check no one's in the house. Um, anyway, I've gone in. And it's still going off. I put me. I put me um, gym bag in. I've gone round to the back garden. And what I've done, I'm there. I'm looking, and I've got my torch out on my phone. And I thought, is that window? Is that you know, like the shadow. Anyway, I've looked and then there's a big hole in the window. So I think, it's just, anyway, next thing, someone pops their head out. Um, you, you know, automatically, like, get the fuck out. Do you know, like, so I've ran through my house and gone round to chase him. Well, I didn't know there was one. So then looks at the street, there's two, lads, so there's two of them. So I'm like a man possessed. I'm speaking to him, like started chasing them, chasing them both. And I'm like, listen, you're not going to get away from me. Just Come here. He was getting married at the time, Craig and his missus, and I thought I didn't know what savings was. I didn't know. I know not everyone keeps cash and stuff, but I didn't know what it was about. And so I've chased them, I've chased them. I'm talking to them as I'm chasing them, and I think they thought we're not getting away from this lunatic, you know. So within hundred meters later, they've gone down the side garden, the side of a garden, and um, I've cornered them both in. And then I always say it's like I can't exactly put one under each arm. Do you know when? Um, I thought, I'm going to walk you back. So I just thought, you know what? You go, you're coming with me and you're going to either have to snitch on your mate if anything's missing or what. Um, so one of them goes and just my luck, there's a concrete slab that's loose as he's climbed it. As I'm in the corner there, next thing, I just feel this bang on my head. Um, he slammed the concrete slab down, you know, on my head. And, I, and I've gone down, but I didn't know it was a concrete slab at the time. I've hit the floor, I've gone down on my knee, gone over on my ankle. And I've gone, wow, what? I knew I'd not been punched. I'd been punched a lot and I knew that wasn't a punch. And anyway, I jumped up straight away, like within a few seconds. And your man who was who hadn't got away, he was climbing over. I've jumped up to try and grab him and he's already halfway over and I couldn't put any weight on my foot. So he's got away and I'm fuming thinking, what the, do you know what I mean? And um, anyway, so I'm raging thinking, but at the time I can't put any weight on my foot. I can't put any weight on my foot. And then I'm, I'm I'm walking, um, I'm trying to, I'm hobbling home and then the next door neighbour and me, um, and uh, my missus, she's, she's like, what's happened? I'm covered in blood. Um, and I'm like, I don't know, they've hit me with something, they put a brick or a slab on me. I didn't know what it was, it turned out it was a concrete slab. Um, I said, but I can't put any weight on me. So I've literally hobbled home, it was a few hundred metres away, hobbled home. My mate, one of my good mates, he's not on the house to pick up tickets for my fight. Um, and, you know, news travels pretty quick and everyone's out and he's, he brought some people in, you know, two lads, who was, you know, just to check it wasn't them. And they're like, no, no, we was just in the area. So yeah, my mum, she did, she's ran around. My mum, like, she only lived at the time five minutes away. She's going, she's going ballistic at me, you know, trying to be an hero and stuff like that and stuff. And, and my mate's talking anyway and... Um, He's going on about us. And in my head, I'm thinking about the fight. 
I'm thinking about the fights four weeks away and I'm talking going, ah, oh, meant to be sparring tomorrow. And then he went, and you can see people looking at me, I went, but sparring, what I'll do? And then you went, sparring, you can't even stand up. And I went, I know, but I'll just swim for, I'll have to get Lee's off the running, I'll just swim for a week or something. And I'll be right then next week. And then my head's cut wide open, the bleeding's not stopping. And you could see, you know, people around there that you could see them going, never in a million years are you fighting, but they probably didn't have the heart to tell me. And I'm just like talking mad going, you know, my head guard will cover that. I mean, it's not ideal. It could come open in a fight. And anyway, my uncle who lived up the road, he come, he went, listen, I have to get you to hospital because next door's mum, she was a nurse and she'd come in and she was trying to stop the bleeding, but he was going, she needs to get to hospital. They got me there. The ambulance was taking too, you know, too long. And we got in the hospital, they rushed me through and um, they recognised me and, so anyway, they've got me through and, and I'm thinking, it was a brain scan or something like that. And they've stitched me up and all that. And I'm thinking, brain scan? I'm for, I'm getting fucking brain scan. I only had one from a medical the other week. I'm fine. Um, and I'm just thinking about the fight. And in my head, I'm like, do this, do that. And um, anyway, and I'm still like, I'm high on adrenaline, you know, at this time, even though my, my ankles, which I didn't know, was broken a few places. It's, um, I remember it, my uncle, he was there, my uncle Darren and um, Fran, she was with me. And we, the doctor sort of come into me and he says, um, they took me through to this room. I said, you're the boxer, aren't you? And I said, yeah, yeah, you're right, mate. I said, uh, he said, you had a fight coming up, didn't you? I said, yes, I'm fighting for my first world title in, um, in four weeks, I said, nightmare, this isn't it, but I'll be all right. And, um, <laughs> and um, your man, he got, and never forget, he said, listen, that won't be happening. And I, and I remember thinking, no, of course it will. What do you mean it won't be happening? And he says, you've got a fractured skull. You've got a fractured skull. And, and I remember just going numb, just absolutely numb and sort of going out. And I don't, I don't even know, I couldn't tell my uncle or Fran, and I don't know if someone told him, and I remember my uncle down and I'll leave you to it, because I think he knew what wanted to break down, wanted to break down, and he just got up and uh, left me and oh, I cried like a baby, I did. Because it was like, just moved into a house, and I thought, oh my God, if I can't box, how am I going to, you know, supply for my family and stuff like that? And yeah, it was it was just a bit true of me, and then obviously you're up all night in the pain and stuff like that, so they moved me, they moved me on to like a private ward because, you know, papers and TV and stuff like that. I didn't know what was going on. And because there was, I was just there on a ward and they were saying, we're going to move you. And I was going, I'm all right here. It's okay. Went, no, we've got to move you because, um, and as they moved me, the next thing, I remember like up all night and like sort of not enough and, you know, eye on painkillers, whatever it may be that was giving me. I remember thinking, you know, something like GMTV. Then it was on BBC Breakfast and then it was on Sports. And I was thinking, what they give me here? Is this happening? You know, like, <laughs> what the fuck did they give me? And um, anyway, it dawned on me then, like, and it just, uh -huh. for me then, that was a big thing for me, James, where I knew positive thinking was a big, you know, a big part in recovery. Do you know, you sit there feeling sorry for yourself. And I probably did have an excuse to feel sorry for myself. You know, I was heartbroken, but I just thought, I made a decision there and then that, I've got it over this. And what, what totally triggered it, I remember going down for surgery. Uh, this would have been on my ankle and I was getting pushed through and there was an older person on lay on the bed and they didn't have long... You could just sort of see like they was in very ill health and I looked at him and you thought, you, I thought, you're not coming out of hospital. You know, not, not in that kind of way and sort of just managed to raise his head and let on to me sort of thing and, you know, smile back and I thought, I'm crying here over this and someone's going to lose their dad, granddad, whatever. And, you know, just stop being, stop being mad and just that. And I always said then, I thought, everything goes well, I get recovered, you know, I can make a recovery and I'm allowed to box again. I've been, it's like I've been given a second chance in life. Make sure I take advantage of it. Make sure I get everything I can out of it. And I always had that attitude, but... That was a, just a reminder. Do you know what I mean? That was a reminder where it was like, I came so close to losing it all, so close to losing it all. And 
thankfully I got a second chance in life. Uh, not in life, but with my career. Um, and that's, that's sort of what I did. And I got off. They give me painkillers for months. And within like a week or so, I'd, I'd got myself off. And even though I didn't have much sleep and stuff, and I went... Because I think... With me, I think like them painkillers and stuff, those prescription stuff, they we know they can fry your be, banana. Yeah, they can they can and I just I'm just really against them and I'm not the biggest guy anyway, but I was going super skinny and I just thought, This and yeah, I can't recover on these. There's no way I can recover on these and and that was it. I'd I just that was there and then where I thought, No, I'm gonna get myself better and it was just so fast the recovery. Scary that to think that Instead of just shouting out the window or yeah. making noises, just, <laughs> you went and chased two burglars. To you've already him, done yeah. the damage and they've ran. Yeah, but that I just know. shows again your character. Try yeah. to help your neighbours because you're thinking they've stole and everyone's of money. They might have some. Do mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And I, that was my thing. Where you could have got fucking stabbed. Could have done. Could have done, but it don't think. Do you know at the time and you you're one of them and everyone says, "Oh, did you find out?" Never found out mm. who it was. And after a bit, I was like, you know, you're a bit resentful and people. This isn't the big way, but people was like, you find out who it is, let me know. And, you know, something bad probably would have happened to them. But I just thought, not me trying to sound a good guy, but if you're robbing houses, you're pretty desperate, aren't you? Yeah. And, you know, and then after a bit, I thought, I don't want to know because what, what pleasure am I going to get out mm. of? What, give him a good idea or have someone give them a good idea? Yeah. I'm not going to get... Then I just, you become no different. I, yeah, I genuinely hope they stopped doing what they was doing. That mm. was their... Shock. That scared them a bit, thinking that can't ever get out. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And if it, genuinely now, I, I mean, if, if I saw the person, I wouldn't I wouldn't go for them or all like that. It's just like, it was hopefully a, a bad time in their life. It was hopefully a yeah. bad time in their life. And, and that was it, mate. That's you amazing know. that you think like that, brother. Fair I've, play to you, man. No, but I just thought, you know, you were undone. It's like... Mm -hmm you know, holding on to a not piece of coal, you're just going to yeah. get burnt, aren't you? And, mm -hmm. and for a bit, I was bitter and I thought, you horrible little fuckers. Do you know, if I can't box again, if I ever find out who you are, I'm going to kill you and stuff like that. And then I just thought, and in time, time's a healer, isn't it, with a lot of things. Yeah. And um, and that was it. Whereas now, I just, what good would it do me do? I hope I never find out if it would do, yeah. then I hope, do you know what I mean? Maybe if you just get a, a message one day yeah. for an apology. You never know. As you know, I interview a lot of, bad men who were bad in the past and done a lot of bad yeah. shit and you kind of people kind of know now their upbringing yeah whether of they've been they've there had a lot of pain they're younger why so they robbing there might be young yeah. kids yeah and yeah. again they might have seen the, you in the news world yeah. title contender yeah lying there with a fucking bandage mm. on the head and that could have that been a way of the call. Off. Yeah, yeah. Might and I hope it, I hope it you did. You could so. cross paths in 10 years and they could go look yeah. and apologise. If it, if it does then, do you know what I mean? It was it was worth getting belted over the head for, <laughs> do you know what I mean? But yeah. World title contender in hospital four weeks later. Well, you must have been... So after that then, what were you thinking? When did you get the all clear? Or were you thinking, my oh, career's I, done? I was having to... Uh, I was having to... Brain scans and stuff? Brain scans and then a bit more in detail. I remember waiting on the board and it was like, when I was waiting to find out, it was just, I couldn't sleep because I kept, like I said, I kept thinking, what am I going to do for a living if I don't, I think I would have been involved in summit and hopefully I had a lot of good friends who would have helped me with a job or something like that. But boxing, I'd sort of put all my eggs in one basket and that's what I'm saying about kids at school. When I went on about, oh, I'll do this, so I've got something to fall back on. I never did have something to fall back on. I was probably, you know, I was, I was lying to my mum and dad saying, oh, I've done this and that and I'm, I'm past this at college or at school and really I was just wanted to be in the gym. I just wanted to be in the gym. So it was then that it come back to me and thinking, why didn't I do that just in case? Because I had no idea what I was going to do. Um, thankfully, I, I got the all clear, but like you say, having a fractured skull being a professional boxer, it ain't the best injury to have, is it? So yeah, I got I got the all clear and yeah because somebody else stepped in and took your place that night and they won actually. Gonna, well, it was Abra Nolan who's going to, and then that fight fell through. So maybe, maybe for some reason, mm -hmm. it wasn't meant to be. I don't know, like some some mad reason yeah. why I got it over the head. What was Eddie Hearn saying when you were in hospital? He just says you fucking idiot. <laughs> 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 you fucking. Yeah, you're uh, you're under ten stone chasing two burglars down the street, and uh, but that's just how it is. You're uh, 
we're the people we are. If someone's in, I've always been taught, if, you know, if someone's doing wrong like that and mm -hmm. your neighbours, you look after your neighbours, don't yeah. you? And you look after your own and if everyone has that attitude, then there won't be none Fuck of that. Fucking chased there. off a box. Yeah, you've you, you, yeah. You're fucked. But it's one of them, uh, like with my mates, do like things you'll do for attention and stuff like that. <laughs> but yeah. publicity. But yeah. that'll probably enhanced your Without career doubt, tenfold. Do you know what? I remember uh, one of my mates saying to me, she's down stupid. He went, this could be the best thing that's ever yeah. happened to you. As I'm laying there, like <laughs> legging plaster, big scar down my head. Yeah, this could be the best thing that's ever happened to you. Mm. And in a way, it was like, for, for the comeback fight for a world title, that... Everyone sort of had a bit of a story to it, you know, say a rocky story, but it had a bit of a story to it and um, it helped. Of it, course it did. Eddie over the first for me, it helped ticket sales, it helped ticket sales a lot. <laughs> it was probably him at set up, yeah, the yeah. <laughs> He's oh, really out. Out. Me but yeah, it worked to me, yeah. uh, So when you got the call again, yeah. for the first world title fight, yeah. that eventually went through, when did you realise it was getting took to your hometown, Manchester? Yeah, well, he phoned me and he said, listen, on the back of this, he says, I think we can come to Manchester and we can do big numbers. He says, you might not know it, but you become a bit of a celebrity <laughs> with it all. And yeah, that was it in the night in July. Um, we come to the arena, come to the arena. It was my world title fight. And that was it. I thought not many people in life get a chance for the dream, you know, for the dreams to come true. And I thought that night I had a chance to make that dream come true. Who was the nerves? Do you know what? It sounds mad. There was there was nerves, but it was excitement and it was it was relief. It was relief, you know. I was back, I was back fighting and I was back doing what I loved and I very nearly lost it. So obviously the first world title fight, it was like it's a really really debated decision whether it was a draw. Um, it was that controversial. They demanded an immediate rematch, but everyone was like, "How did you?" Do you know, how did you remain so calm after it? I wasn't you. And yeah, I was upset. I was upset, but at the same time, I was just thankful to be doing what I'd done. And I dreamed of top, I dreamed of being in world title fights at that arena since I was a little boy. And I always remember my best mate saying to me when, we was on about Joe Calzaga. Um, he bought Jeff Lisa, put in one of the best performances we've ever seen in a British ring. And I'm sat there in the, in the stands and he says, he's coming out and... Like best mates do, this will be you one day, this. And at the same time, you're thinking, hey, you would say that, but it always stuck with me. And I'm walking out that night and that moment replayed to me, you know, sort of, that was my that was my moment to fight, you know, for a world title in the city where I'm from, the arena where I've gone since was being kids, you know, saving up pocket money to go and be in the upper tiers, to be in the gods. Yeah, that was that was my night. So I was I thought I had a lot to be thankful for as well. Was that the James Arthur tune? And did you have Whitney Houston? Whitney Houston as Whitney well. Whitney always, yeah. So Whitney. Why, Million Dollar How Bill. did your music come about? Obviously, the nickname Million Dollar Crawler, or so Million mm -hmm. Dollar Bill, fitted. But it's a bit. Um, it's not your typical ring walk music. It's no gangster rap, is it, Whitney? <laughs> but it worked. It worked as you see. Mm. Like it was catchy. You'd have everyone uh -huh. singing along. But before it, I'd always have James, James Arthur, um, hometown glory. And it just worked well. I was um, I was a sucker for reality TV. And mm. like, do you know X Factor and stuff? And I always liked him. And I always remember him singing it one week. And um, it was mad. It was like, you know, to be at all. so Eddie said, what are you coming out to Saturday? The usual, like, million dollars. I went, yeah, I said, but what I'm, I'm doing before it sounds a bit cheesy, but I'm coming out to hometown glory. And he went, mate, he said, I have wanted someone to come out to that for years, but not not the Adele version. There was a guy on X Factor called Jay, and I went, mate, that's the one. And it was like it was meant to be. So every time now, every time after that, I was at the arena. That's what I come out to. Mm -hmm. That's what I come out to. And um, yeah, it was good. And obviously then we got the rematch and it was um, it was one of the, the greatest nights of my life, you know, other than other than the birth of my little boy. How fast did the rematch come about? The rematch, so it was July. So what happened is I went from being the boxer, just got hit over the head with a paving slab, to the boxer who got robbed of a world title because, you know, it was a draw, it was a controversial draw and horrible decision. But they granted a rematch straight away. So that was in July, then November, I think it was just after... Uh, yeah, it's a birthday. Yeah, 2015. Yeah, I um, I got I got a rematch and 
the fifth round, I landed one of the, the best body shots. shots yeah, I've ever threw in my career. One of the best punches I've ever threw in my career. And yeah, the roof nearly come off the arena. There is, um, and that you sort of see when when you can see the relief. There was so many emotions. There was joy. There was there was relief. And and do you know what I felt like? You know all the sacrifices from my mum getting on buses to me to get me to the gym, to getting run up and down the country to missing out on nights out with my mates to Joe you know, making those sacrifice everything was worth it then and yeah it was like I said not many people's dreams come true in life and that night it did is that felt because there was motion that night for him everything you'd went through yeah the slab thing and that's it the that's, rematch losing it the first time did yeah. you feel as if I'm never going to win a world title yeah like there was people who who thought, you know, that was your night last time, you got a bad decision and you should have got the win rather than draw. And they think, well, that's your moment, that was your, that was meant to be, he's going to come back better. And I always knew, I thought, it was mad. Before the fight, the rematch, Eddie Earn said, he was in the, cha he told me after the fight, he went, I was fuming in the changing rooms. I thought, he's too laid back. But it was like, you know, when sometimes, I can't start saying, oh, I believe in fate and all this and that, but, I knew that was meant to be my night. And I remember thinking, I'm not coming back to this chess room without that world title. And it was the most relaxed I've ever been, which really I should have been the most nervous I've ever been, you know. My shot at a world title might have been my last shot at a world title. But I was the most calm I've ever been. And I thought, I'm going to walk out here and own this and win mm -hmm. a world title. And thankfully, that's what I did. 28 years of age, yeah. Go shake your hand for that, bro. Well yeah. done, mate. That's amazing, though, from everything that you've went through. And yeah. Such a nice guy, humble as fuck. And, and do, do you know what? I've had Tony Bell, you and stuff on, Willie. All brand new. Just yeah. good fucking guys, man. Boxing, I, I genuinely believe this. Boxing, is, you're very, like all walks of life and all jobs, you meet, you meet some snakes. But you meet a lot of good people in boxing. And I'm thankful where... And that's why I think we've got to be careful because with boxing, it can be a brutal, horrible sport. I've seen the horrible sides of it, but it's also made my life a little bit easier. It's made, you know, my family's life a little bit easier, give friends some great nights. And it's took me to places around the world that I never would have gone without it, whether that be a fighter, a training camp, supporting people. But um, you meet a lot of lifelong friends in boxing and, and that's what I've done, you know. Yeah. And, and it's worth, like, when when they fight, your friends fight, it's almost, I get more nervous for them than what I did when I fought, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's because you're not in control of it, you're not in control of it, but yeah, it's a, it's a funny old game, mate, it's a funny old game. How was game. your mum and dad? My, my dad did was they ever cool. say they're proud of you that night? Cool. He might have said it to other people, he might have said it to other people and his reaction, mm -hmm. but he was, listen. Of course, was, man. Yeah. But uh, my mum used to always, like, she'd just wait for the message. She'd mind my little boy, and she'd just wait for the message, like, however, you know, I was okay. And she turned, she couldn't, she couldn't watch anything. She just, she couldn't watch the boxing. She's mad, mum loves boxing, but she mm -hmm. could not watch me. And, um, yeah, she'd always ring her when I got back to the changing room. My mum would be the first person who would ring and say, yeah, I'm okay, mum, you're all right, and... Yeah, mm -hmm. that's yeah, it. World title, that. And then mate. she could watch it then. Yeah. So you defended your title after that. Yeah. And then you lost your title. Yeah. How was that feeling to yeah, have to everything so that you set your I, mind to to then yeah, losing it? I defended my world title in a fight that, again, people didn't expect me to win. And that was possibly the greatest night of my career against Dermot Smell, but also. So then after that, I fought for like the best prize in the sport against a fight we had looked up to, you know, early on in my career. Um, Yorgi Lanai was in. Great guy, great guy, and we had a great fight. We had a great fight, and um, the first one there, and he, he just, I was think I was so close to, to breaking him at one point in the fight, and then um, I would have had the most prestigious marbles in boxing. Do you know what I mean? But it wasn't meant to be that night. But um, it's, I, I sort of, do you know what it was? Obviously, you're disappointed. You've never been. I'm never going to celebrate losing but it sort of a bit of it was it hit me sort of how far I'd come in such a short time from an hospital bed to winning a world title defending a world title and then you know fighting the very elite in the sport why did you never get any like, after the slab thing did they tune up fight just straight into a world title went straight into a world title because world title fights don't come around yeah. like it could it could have been easily someone else so it took me all of two seconds to decide. <laughs> you know, that's to a decide big move, though, isn't it? 
Yeah, I said, no, I'll take it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Eddie phoned me and he said, you could either have a tune-up fight and then we can hope to get a world title fight, which I think, you know, we can get. I just went, no, we'll take the world title fight. Take yeah. the world title fight. So after your other two world title shots with, what's his name again? The boy. Le there's Linares. Yeah, Linares. Yeah. And then he had the, the few fights in between. But um, then you got, got a call for... Shot. When, when did you do the prize fighter? Oh, that was that was way back. Yes, yeah, that, that was, was back, early that, doors, yeah, wasn't it? Though that's when you were so, young, young. Yeah, young, but yeah. So I've after after the Nares, I put a few. Obviously, we boxed Ricky, mm -hmm. um, I boxed a good under Indonesian fella, Dal Jordan, but um, also Lomachenko. Yeah, then that was it, Lomachenko. How did then, that fight come about? Because I do the mandatory spot. You know, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd won world title final eliminators, and I I boxed. I then earned the right to fight one of the greatest the sport's ever seen. Um, and then I think just before that, I think the fight before it was my last big night. It'd been a hard career and I performed. And I remember after the fight before that Jordan fight, my, my, in the post-fight drug test, my urine was, was purple. Do you know? Um, and that's more about the brutal side of the sport. But yeah, it was... Um, so I the right to to fight Lomachenko, which obviously was not about doing it. It weren't like I didn't win a lottery. I didn't win a raffle to, to fight him. And that was over in um Yeah, but you're, a world, you're a world champion. Yeah, world champion. That was going to two-time yeah. world, cha two world champion. Um, and obviously, listen, just before that, I mean, not before the fight, I didn't think like that. But when I look back now, my best days are probably just behind me, do you know, before that. Um, but that was a mad experience again. Do you know, just little mad things like... I remember the day of the weigh-in, there was, um, you know, the rapper Nipsey Hussle. Mm -hmm. It was his funeral in LA. that You'd never seen a police presence like it. And as I'm weighing in, you've got your P. Diddy's, your, um, your Kanye's and stuff, like, at the side of where the weigh-in was, you know, going to this funeral and stuff, like, where the mass was in the Staples Centre, um, you know, the service. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, like, fucking hell, like, a boy from sort of New Eve, New Mostyn, Manchester, like, it's a bit mad how this is going yeah, to out, you know? So the proud moment, you know, I look back and obviously getting flattened by Lomachenko wasn't, but it was just when I look back and this boxing's a funny old game, um, but I wouldn't, there's, at the time, there'd be times where I'd look to, do you know, I'd change things, but I think everything does happen for a reason in a way. Yeah. And it leads you on the path you're on. And, and that was it. It was... It was it was good to me, but it was um, it was a mad mad journey. Do you but know that's I mean? a phenomenal career, brother. Do yeah, you think you discredit yourself a little bit sometimes? I don't know. Fuck's sake, world title. Yeah. You've had about four or five world title fights. Yeah. You've been a world I, champion. The best. Yeah. You fought one of the best pound for pounds. Yeah. Lomachenko. I seen his fight actually last week. Yeah, um, that was it. At, at Lopez, Lopez, Lopez yeah. was immense. Unbelievable. That's it. I, I fought. I fought the best of my era, really. Yeah. And, so I can walk away with no regrets. Walk away with no regrets. How was that? Because you had one more fight that you won. Yeah. How was it after that to then, did you already decide? Was yeah. Lomachenko you know, your big payday and then it was kind of retire? I was, um, it was, it was time to retire. And then Eddie, had, it was mad. Eddie had um, messaged me and I said, I was saying, oh, I think I'm going to have one more fight. And Eddie had messaged me and said, oh, November the 2nd, Manchester Arena. You know where the eyes are mold, yeah. As if to say, you know, think about it. And I just landed in a for airport and I've gone, yeah, sign me up, <laughs> sign me up. And um, I'm sure you've been a beefer and it was mad. And I didn't think about the fight, like, didn't think about the fight. I think it was just there. And I remember being away for a few days and then coming back. And I always caught me, you know, that for airport. Do you know where that Burger King is? Yeah. You see some corpses, don't you? Everybody you lying see? on the floor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Burger King <laughs> is death. There's just, there's just bodies there yeah. in there and like people who've probably not mm -hmm. for days. And and I didn't. I didn't have a mad one or out like that. I, I was chill. But I remember going through the airport. And, but I remember thinking, I feel like them. I <laughs> like just thinking, why have you agreed to this? But I've already given a word to it. I've already given a word to it, so I can't go back on it. But I remember thinking, why have I done this? Why have I done this? And I'm, I'm thinking, although I don't look, I don't, hopefully I don't look like some of these people on the inside. I probably feel like him. <laughs> and um, really I should have retired. And anyway, I committed to it. 
Ended up having the fight. Um, I won on points. Didn't box nowhere near as well as what I should have done. But it gave me closure, you know, on a, on a career. And I just think I wasn't... It's one of them, like, I believe I've looked after myself since. I could probably fight at the same level and make an easier job of it, of it than what I did that night. But I think just the old emotions. And I remember looking through my phone on the day and I was getting the nicest of messages from people saying, it's been some ride and it's been an honour to watch you for there. And they made me a bit emotional. And on the night, I think I probably fought with too much emotions. But then at the same time, the fight started a few rounds in and I even got introduced by Michael Buffer for the last time ever, you know, for the mm -hmm. last time. And everything sort of done me. And then when the bell went, it was like, oh, I've still got a fight here. Do you know, like this leaving party, but I've got a fight now. Yeah. And I was just sort of, bit off with the pace and like I say I got the win but I was just I wasn't happy with the performance but I was I was like annoyed with myself for an hour um you see a few family and friends after it a drink or two goes down and do you know what it was and it was like I'm glad it's over thank god it's over and that's not because I love boxing I love the job and I live the dream do you know I I said it before it took me to places that I could only dream of but you meet so many good people. I met like people who was my heroes growing up and, you know, become friendship friends with those people. But I was just glad it was all over. I um I knew I knew it was my time to bow out and I'd seen it with people close to me. You stay in boxing too long, it's not good for you. It yeah. takes more I always use the line of don't let boxing take more from you than you take from boxing. I've seen it so many times and I want it to be an example to some of the kids in the area. I don't want to be slurring my words i don't want to be punch drunk i don't do you know i don't want balance affected and stuff like that so i knew it was my time to go and um and that was it that was it mate and, make your um, mind up and that was it because 32 is young never, yeah 32 is young but i'd had a mad career and i think everything since the accident right through it was it was a mad sort of four years non-stop um was it four years or five years you know on top of that, and like I said, in, in the career, you know, in touching them, there was times where it was hard, it was hard, you know, it was, I was called million dollar and I was fucking living in bump beds with my little brother, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It was uh, driving around on like my little courser on finance yeah. and stuff. I was, you know, it was hard, it was, it was tough where a lot of people, I believe, would have come away from that. You couldn't afford to, you know, you just sort of getting by with enough money to put petrol in your car to get to the gym. So I knew that I'd got everything I could out of boxing. And sometimes you've just got to let things go, aren't you? All good things come to an end eventually. And that was it. And I didn't want to be that fighter who stayed there too long. Yeah, but that shows you again how sensible you are to yeah. setting your mind to it, agreeing with it and then coming out. Because yeah. you can be sitting here, listen, you could probably, yes. you, you've potentially just lost another three, four maybe world title shots yeah. that you could still probably yeah, I could have get continued involved in now. And you'll level, see got some a lot of the boxers days. sitting there and thinking 38, 39 and then they come yeah. back. and That's it. And I, I won't do that. And a few people have said to me, you're going to come back. And I went, I won't because... I'm happy now, I'm in the gym, I'm coaching all the time, but so I'm still around that gym banter. Whereas I have feel guilty in it. I see some fighters retire and they proper struggle with it. I've not, do you know what I mean? I've, I've really not, I'm, I'm happy with everything. Listen, I, I set out of boxing, when I, at the start of my professional career, I thought my, my aim is to try and become a world champion and also to get an house paid for because I think once you've got an house paid for life's just a little bit easier isn't it you know you've not got a mortgage hanging over you I watched my mum and dad graph for 30 odd years to pay a mortgage off mm -hmm. and um, you know I've got that and more so I've got to be thankful so that's when I think whatever you do in life if you become greedy whether you get caught doing if you're up to no good in boxing, you get greedy, you stand around, it'll affect you later on in life yeah a million percent don't want to be that guy yeah. what was that training camp like for you? A training camp was into training camps was harder than the fights and do you know it was you was hard, you was tired, you was moody and listen, I I think you see so many relationships go through a boxer off a training camp because it's hard. They're not we're not the nicest of people to be around because you just boxing you have half got to be selfish, but you know, you're on a diet, you can't just do little things like get a takeaway on a Friday night mm. and stuff like that and it's tough. It's um, those training camps. There's times where you look back and think, oh, I was the fittest I've ever been in my life. But also, 
it was it was just it was draining but you had to be learning each camp I'd always try and better myself and better myself and I did I think but it was um, they would take so much off you they would take so much off you and I think people thought they'd see you on fight night and just like any you know a footballer when they turn up on match day but there's so many sacrifices that go on before that so many sacrifices and yeah you I always say listen if I'd love to be a boxer or I'd love to be a footballer but okay but would you love to live the life that they have to live up until that night you probably wouldn't because it's horrible it's lonely it's tough it's hard but in a strange way I loved it yeah you know yeah mm -hmm. How, you must have obviously massive Man U fan. Yeah. How never Old Trafford come about? Because you would have so yeah. out, no doubt. everyone always said it, but it's it's always hard with with those outdoor events. The overheads are huge and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And I think it takes something as big as Tyson Fury, Anthony Joshua to... Again, I wouldn't discredit yourself yeah. with the Manchester support no, you've got behind know. you, mate. Maybe, you know, they would have turned out, so mm -hmm. maybe so, but it's... Um, I don't know, it's madness. That would have been the ultimate. Like, like I said, that fighting at that arena, honestly, you don't understand it was there was something special to me every time and people would say it about the nights. There, there was something else. How many times were you in there? Six, there seven times? A few? More, more. I don't yeah. know. I was in your whole career. 30, I've... Yeah, I should know that. It was a fact actually because I'd been in more title fights, I think, than anyone there. Mm -hmm. Um but you know what people stop stop me and I was in town then before and one of the builders you know, I was there at the arena for so many you know and it means loads to us yeah. you know what I mean I talked to him and it's like there was big nights for the city but I didn't realise because I was just the one getting mm -hmm. punched in the head yeah. do you know what I mean I um, I wasn't I didn't see it like you know the, the old days like people would meet early in the pub they'd make a big day of it and it was mad I'd always go into the chipping here, Rust, on a Sunday night, a bit of a takeaway after, and, and the amount of people who was in there, we saw Reds, and they go, oh, fucking, <laughs> I'm in the bad books because uh, of you, and uh, <laughs> my missus is going to kill me, and this yeah. and that, yeah. Uh -huh. It was great, it was great, but just little things, but you don't realise it when you, mm -hmm. you know, when you're the, a part of it, but it was had. a big thing, yeah, it was a big thing. What do you think of the featherweight division now? Is um. I think British boxing in general is in great, in a great place. I think so. Yeah, I think it's in a great place. And kids who are coming through the Olympians next year, um, I think boxing's as big as it's ever been. Um, I think two of the most recognisable athletes on the planet in any sport, um, Tyson, Tyson Fury, Fury and Andy yeah. Joshua, yeah, both, um, you know, both, both boxers, and I think you know I'd put them up there with almost anyone. Yeah. There's only like your Ronaldo's, maybe McGregor and stuff like that. Yeah, right yeah, but yeah. they're right up there. They're right up there. Uh, boxing's at an all time high, and you see it in the gyms now. The gyms are packed out. And yeah. I think it's because I know Tyson Fury speaks out about mental health and he knows how much it's good for keeping you sane and working yeah. hard. Fitness is key to any sort of depression. And we've got, you, yeah, we've, um, with Tyson, he's been a great you know, advocate for it. He's been like, a great role model for so many because of the place where he was. And that's the thing now, the situation we're in now about gyms getting locked down, you don't realise the mental health it does do for people. And I'm like, and I think so many people, they can they think, well, if Tyson Fury can do that and be heavyweight champion of the world, you know, I can come back and live, get my life back on track. And I think it's good, you know, that's, that's someone who I think they can relate to. I'm not saying the six foot eight or six foot nine, I'm going to yeah. be champion of the world, but... Do you know, sort of a man of the people. Whereas they're not going to, and me, this is one of my big stories, because mental health's a big thing for me. Do you know where I see it in the gym? I see it with some of the younger kids. It can start from an early age, but I don't, and listen, that might be the reason why you might sort of disagree, but that might be what's leading, the mental health might be leading to that, but I can't take it when I'm seeing someone who's off the nut, Friday, Saturday, sticking yeah, stuff up the nose, course. and then they're preaching yeah. mental health on a mm -hmm. Monday, Tuesday. I'm like, no, you're on a come down. I've seen it. I've seen yeah. it with people close to me. Same. And I'm like, you know, James, and I'm like, no, I don't, mm. I don't want to know about, don't start talking yeah. like this. And it might sound a bit harsh, but I don't want you to start talking like this and feeling sorry for yourself. What you're on is a come down because yeah. you've been an idiot. And um, 
And that's why I think, you know, because I've seen people who genuinely, you have proper genuine mental health problems mm. and um, they're the kind of role models that you want them to look up yeah. to rather than someone on social media posting up a quote yeah. or posting up a summit. I think you know? it's easy to self-medicate. People yeah. don't know how to handle their thought process. Yes. So the drink, the drugs takes them away from totally. their method of thinking. But if you've got, if you're really struggling with like depression, mental health, mental health's are different from yeah. maybe depression from a weekend bender. Yes. But if you are yeah. struggling, if you come off the gear, the alcohol for two, three weeks, yeah. you'll feel a totally different got to look after vibration yourself. in yourself. And you know better than me, Jim, but you've got to look after yeah. yourself. And then, you know, if you're still feeling in a certain way, then mm -hmm. there might be problems. But I just think you've got to look after yourself. Yeah, and exercise is key. Exercise is so mm -hmm. key. And it's, it's like now we've working some of the kids in the area. It's, it's great sort of seeing that now the gyms are back open, just the change in some of them, the change in some of them, you have the parents saying it and the schools saying it. And it's, um, honestly, I believe exercise yeah. is the key to so many. Illnesses. And happiness isn't a 24 seven thing, it's but you not. could win world titles and you're back to your normal it's state not. the next day. And we, this is what people need to understand when you're exercising, you feel yeah. great. That's why you've got to do it consistently. Yeah, we don't, we don't live in Disney. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's, it's not, it's, it's make belief. It's, mm -hmm. um, it does, that's the thing for me now, sort of what I'm going to sort of go into sort of now in life, sort of working with the kids who are at risk of exclusion who might have sort of the mental health problems. I'll come from a troubled background um, because like you say, exercise, and listen, they're not, everyone who walks through the amateur gym where I'm at, they're not going to be a world champion, but they might, do you know what, it just brings them out of the shell, just gives them, confidence. You know, life skills yeah. life skills and stuff like that and that's why i'm so big on exercise mm -hmm. when you got your gym was it the gym you trained at and then it gets set in fire no so what i did i was um no I'd, i was, was professional but then my amateur gym was going to be without mm -hmm. a home and i'd always stayed coaching there a few times a week so I, I took over the amateur gym um got that and then the first day of lockdown first weekend of lockdown the building that it was in got set on fire, you know, in an arson attack, and it was it was nothing to do with with us. Or well, I hope not. <laughs> it was no, uh, <laughs> we've got any enemies, but there was a lot of businesses in there, and there was left without, um, you know, it was left without a gym, and we just uh, actually building the other gym now, so we're getting it all kitted out in the next four weeks. We'll be we'll be up and running, and I can't wait for it. We're using a friend's gym at the minute, but um, we'll have our own place, and that's the plan now to. We'll have the amateurs in there. We'll have professional fighters. My own, like, same room coaching. But we'll also have kids in the area at risk of exclusion. And there's just, like, there's a kid who we work with now. Um, he's a great kid. Four four of his brothers are all in prison. He's not really got a father figure. And I think, if I work with you, I can stop you going. I can stop you going down that path. And, and if I do, then it's a massive thing for me. Do you yeah, know what I mean? He's not, not going to be a world champion. He's not, not going to have a fight, but... He was just in the gym and he can sort of dedicate. And I just think now if you can try and give a little bit back yeah. in the area. And channel their then, energy. Yeah, channel their energy. And that's that's a big thing. Yeah, that's massive, me. man. Especially give for the back. career you have. And then you're still in there getting your yeah. hands dirty, trying to save other that's kids what from... I think, you yeah. know, I think it's always good to try and give back, isn't it? And listen, I'm not going to sit here and listen, people go, oh, well, you get paid for that. Well, there'll be a wage for some of it, but some of it's all, you know, some mm -hmm. of it's voluntary. Yeah. But... Um, it's rewarding and sometimes it's listen you could set some up and there's a lot of funding going around now and yeah you could earn good money off it but i i don't i want to do you know what i want to do is sort of just kids in the area sort of just stop them going off stop them going down the wrong path yeah that's a so big thing for me through your amazing career fought some fucking top class world yeah. fighters now you're trying to help the kids. What else you got planned? You still get your looks, still yeah. get your hair. I'm trying, Lucky mate. bastard, I man. I I've had a few boxers on you, not as pretty <laughs> as you, mate. Mate, the nose is a bit fat now. The nose is a bit fat So what's the plans for the future? Yeah, so the plans now is I'm coaching, mm -hmm. um, both professional and amateur. Um, like I said then, be working with the kids in the area and uh, doing bits of TV, radio. It's mad, like, sometimes, you know, I'm ringside talking about talking about a fight between two world-class fighters. And I think it's great. This I'm getting paid to talk mm -hmm. about the sport that I love, the job that I love. And yeah, I, um, that sort of plenty more of that, but that's the biggest thing for me is to set up, to set up the gym and have it running each, each day, having different, different school children in who are at trouble in school, trying to stop them getting kicked out of school. 
and sort of give him a bit of direction in life. I'm not going to pretend oh, I'm Coach Carter or nothing like that. <laughs> great but, film, yeah, by the way. Yeah, great film. Great film. But some of these kids are good kids. And mm -hmm. School's not for everyone, but I believe that if they can channel some of that energy in a, in a boxing gym or whatever, then um, it's a great thing. But I think that's that's it really you know my that's that's my aim in um in life now the second part of my life i think just to, to get do back that. you're still 33 yeah. you're i'm 36 right. man you're, i'm hitting 40 yeah. it's horrible is yeah. um what's the best fight you've ever been in what's the one you've best really loved you stood out i think the um the ismail barroso fight you know yeah he says defending that. my world title mm -hmm. getting introduced off the legendary michael buffer one of the coolest guys on the planet um, in a fight, even though I was champion, and a lot of people didn't think I was going to win, to win that game plan carried out to perfection, and the atmosphere that night was mental. Um, I remember like after party, after it coming out, and literally, I only put it on yesterday. Literally, the walk of shame from the club to the old set to the <laughs> sky cameras. Should probably stink in mm. a boot. Just good times, yeah. do you know what I mean? But yeah, that was the best fight I'm involved in because it was just. It was just, you know, when there's doubters and underdog. you made doubters believers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, underdog. Um, everyone loves a good underdog story and that's what yeah. it was. So I think that was that was probably my finest hour, to be honest. What's the best fight you've ever watched? Best fight I've ever watched. Wow. Um, do you know, up close, um, Frotch Grove's one was unbelievable. Ah, yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. Um, Frotch was rocked as well, man. I remember Rocked. just thinking, wow. He didn't even know he was on his ass. Yeah, he, 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 was, he was out. And then as he hit the floor, he sort of woke up. Yeah. But I think that was up close. I've seen a lot of great fights, you know, close up. But um, And then I think on telly, one that always sticks out to me. I remember watching it just at the road, that Manana and Grandad's when he was here. Ben and McLennan. And again, that shows the brutal yeah. side of it. Do you know, he's, he had life-changing injuries. 20-odd years, oh, he's, he's not had a quality of life. Um, but again, that was a big underdog story, and I love that. But just not what happened after it. Yeah, the heavyweights, the two big dogs, Joshua and Tyson. Who do you think wins? Mate, I've always said for a long time. Um, I believe, and not because I've known him for a long time, but I believe a fit and focused Tyson Fury is the best heavyweight on the planet. That's I think my so. opinion. I think yeah. if he and I just hope yeah. it happens. Why did the fuck about man? Is it just money now? I think money could be one thing, but and you could say egos and mm -hmm. not even just from them, like the people above him, um, but also you know contracts and then mandatory challenges. But I just really hope it it can happen, and I hope it happens over here. It might not. Um, nothing against an, an event happening in Saudi. I've been to one, but you just think Wembley it's the or biggest, something. Yeah, Wembley or Old Trafford or anywhere. You know, Spurs mm -hmm. ground. I just want to you want to see the the biggest fight in British boxing history. You want to see it happen in yeah. Britain, don't you? I think Tyson's got to be one of the greatest heavyweights of all time. Do you yeah, think he's underrated he as is. well? Yeah, do you so? think he's underrated? Because of the fight with, with Klitschko and the what he's come back for and he, he totally schooled it's the uh, Wilder. Stories, the story's yeah. unreal and it's mad. I was in just, uh, I was in Regal with him a few weeks ago at a boxing event and um, it's mad. Like I said, he's a superstar now. He's a... Um, I remember him stopping traffic. People were just yeah. leaving engines running. He was mad. He was <laughs> mad. He's a superstar. Um, but yeah, it's, I think everyone loves the story and it's mad. Yeah. Like he's, he's more popular now or when he's come back. Now he's had his downfall. and he's come Because we love a comeback story, yeah. don't we, than what he was when he was mm -hmm. young, champion, defrauding Klitschko. It's, um, it's great, but hopefully him and Joshua, who's, who's done a lot for British boxing, He's a nice Boxing. guy, yeah. man. He's just a nice, nice guy. He doesn't guy. bullshit. And again, he's, yeah. uh, he's had a story he's yeah, come around. London, and, yeah. Mate, just two great guys and you just hope that it happens. I think um, it will. It's next year, though, but... You sometimes yeah. think there's that much money involved. It can't not happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, next so fingers year, crossed. Hopefully we'll yeah, mate, we'll be there. We will. For any kid that's watching, anybody watching that's maybe struggling or maybe want to start boxing, yeah. what advice would you give for them? I'd say, listen, the, the hardest thing for some of those kids is stepping in the gym. Um it's it can be a daunting thing you know going to a boxing gym can be an intimidating thing but one thing i've never seen in a boxing gym and i think a lot of people have backed me up here i've never seen bullying in a boxing gym which is why they're so keen to get it back into schools i've never seen racism in a boxing gym do you know with um in so many boxing gyms we have kids of all races boys girls and like i said bullies will get found out in a boxing gym so that's what's great about it so if that's one of your worries, if either or any of them, um, two things are you worried, then I'd 
say I've never seen it. I've been in a lot of boxing gyms over the years. So, um, listen, get in there. And I'm not saying every fight is going to be a champion, a world champion, but I think it'll change your life for the better. Yeah. Anthony, for coming on today, brother, and mate, telling your stories, it's been phenomenal. Oh, mate, Great career, mate, and honestly, I genuinely wish, one of the nicest guys you've ever met, I wish you all the best oh, for the future, James, brother. Thank you, mate, thank great you. chatting to you. Check out more of my podcasts on the right, and be sure to like, share, and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.